welcome you to the 15th edition of the India Today Conclave. This year we are also celebrating India Today's 40th anniversary, which makes this event even more special for us. I am grateful to the millions of readers and viewers who have supported us all through these years. So on the 40th anniversary of India Today, I am delighted to unveil the underlying theme of this conclave, which is the world tomorrow. Also in our 40th year, we've looked ahead and launched a 24 by 7 news channel called India Today, which embodies the same values of credible, independent journalism without fear or favor to anyone. This is what India Today magazine has stood for for the last 40 years. We are now therefore available in print, on air and online as one brand. We have for you, ladies and gentlemen, an amazing array of speakers from across the globe on a wide range of topics. They've been handpicked for their expertise in areas that will be impact the world we will leave for the next generation. Great conversations, fresh ideas, spectacular performances. Ladies and gentlemen, think of it as a boot camp for the mind, with some luxuries throw in, thrown in. Enjoy the conclave. <laughs> Realistically speaking, the current global environment is not a global environment where anybody in the world can achieve a double-digit growth. And therefore, uh, uh, the discussion really is theoretical. It's based on a premise that this kind of a situation or this cycle doesn't last indefinitely. And therefore, given the various variables, can we at least uh, aim high and improve? For example, uh, if you carry on some of the pending reforms that are still there, if you concentrate on some of these areas which I have just mentioned, if we are to able to improve the health of our banking system so as to be able to support growth, uh, your, your, your private sector becomes more oriented towards investment, then even if you are not able to go anywhere close to a double-digit growth, the prospect of greater economic activity and improving upon your present rates is always there. I think uh, there is a headspace that India has. It's only when the global tailwinds are behind you that, that it adds another percent or two to your own potential. But I think there is a lot that India can still do in order to improve upon. For instance, I took only a small step this year on my promise on direct tax reforms, settling all disputes, etc., etc., rationalizing rates, uh, bringing down corporate rates. Uh, I've only made symbolic uh, changes this year. And the idea was to express a determination that the target really is 25%. Even though if you recollect last year when I announced this, Parliament in the first instance didn't understand it. And the only point on which uh, I had some hostile noises is when I said corporate rates must come down to 25%. And when in the course of the debate I explained to them that corporates must have surplus to reinvest and you can't take, compete with global economies unless you have global taxation rates, slowly I think the political system started understanding this. Uh, you had mentioned you'd got through the other bill, but the GST has been held up and the opposition accuses the government of being intransigent, not wanting to talk to them talking down to them, that's one of the uh, charges that has been. What is the problem? Why aren't you getting them on board? You see, first of all, uh, let us uh, speak in terms of uh, who's not talking. Today, every state government, including all Congress state governments, and I have personally spoken to each one of the Congress state governments, tells me that they are in favor of the GST. You have every political party in parliament which has said we will vote in favor. In the Lok Sabha, every party, Congress walked out, every other party voted in favor. The Congress party, now I read a statement, has only one issue about a constitutional uh, cap, which is a little difficult to impact because neither are tariffs decided through constitutional amendments. It, it is extremely difficult to accept a situation that uh, 
every time you need uh, uh, to increase tariffs in a given emergency, uh, you have to amend the constitution and we all know how difficult it is to amend the constitution. Normally tariffs are decided in schedules. In the GST where centre and states decide together, the tariffs will be decided by the GST council and therefore can't be decided by a constitutional gap. I think that's the only glitch that remains. I would still like the Congress party to come on board. And uh, uh, I can easily see, and this is going to happen in this phase of the biennial elections, the numbers are significantly changing. And in any case, uh, I am reasonably confident that the numbers in the upper house now also are in favor of the GST. What is the RSS influence on making of the budget, on economic reforms? And is there a fight or are they with, with the government on this? Well, I must tell you uh, 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 that the budgets are decided by the governments within. I do consult a lot of people. We have, uh, all, these are almost public sessions uh, where we have consultations. And uh, we have uh, in those consultation sessions, uh, trade unions of all kinds which come over. Uh, the inter comes, the ATA comes, the BMS also comes. They have their considered views, but eventually the last word belongs to the government. You, you can't agree with everything that uh, different groups suggest. Of course, uh, what they said is some valuable opinions which are given, which we take into consideration. That's about all. No fight with them. There's no I major think, differences that think, you have. I don't think... On I don't subsidies, th on... Uh, you, you know, see, the emphasis on, on subsidies, uh, our policy is very rational and logical. We are continuing with subsidies, but our subsidies are meant only for the vulnerable. Uh, a very small question. Even as we speak, Vijay Malia's house in Mumbai is being auctioned, uh, Kingfisher House. I wanted to ask this. Do you see Vijay Malia really as an absconder guilty of malfeasance? And do you accept that Vijay Malia actually is one of many industrialists, some even more high profile and even more well connected to your government, who actually have even larger NPAs? Are you going to act against them? Do you believe it's individuals who are responsible or the banking system well, or the political me, system responsible? Let me... Let me not uh, give you an answer which you would want to sensationalize. Uh, uh, no, give me an honest answer. My, mine will be an <laughs> honest answer because uh, uh, I have to answer for sins my predecessors have committed. Uh, you see, the NPA problem is really on two counts. One part of the problem is because certain sectors of the economy had slowed down. So if you analyze the NPAs, the largest are in the steel sector, which was facing a huge Chinese surge coming into India, where large amount of loans have been given in individual cases and some of those people would have misconducted themselves there may not be adequate sureties and that's a source of worry I think these cases need to be segregated from the rest of the cases which are on account of the sectoral slowdown I think our immediate job as a government is to make sure that our banks, particularly the public sector banks, remain strong. So I am trying to recapitalize the banks. The Reserve Bank has uh, two weeks ago taken a step in order to ease in their capital norms, so which brings in more capital into the banks itself. But do you see Mr. Malia as uh, an absconder guilty of malfeasance? Well, why do you want me to make comments on uh, individual... You had a full debate in Parliament on it. That's why I'm asking That's you, where, right. where does I the have, government stand what I have it? to say, what I have to say, his facts are clear, it's pending in court. Every government agency, whether it's the taxation department or it's the investigative agencies, wherever he has violated the law, is going to take strong action. As far as the banks are concerned, I've found out the details from the bankers itself. I've been briefed that they are going all out to recover every penny of the last rupee that they can from him.
India Today conclave is about thinking out of the box and trying to come up with innovative ways of doing things. This year, keeping with the tradition of breaking new ground, India Today conclave introduced an exciting new way of discussing ideas. Pecha Kucha 2020. For the first time ever, Modi government's top ministers discussed their ideas of India in a presentation format that has gone viral in 800 cities across the globe. Each minister had 6 minutes and 40 seconds to present his or her ideas through 20 slides that lasted for 20 seconds each. So I want to start by asking Nitinji about you know, what a cabinet meeting is like because people on the outside don't know much about how the Modi Sarkar functions. We've seen a lot of what you've been able to achieve. Uh, but people would like to know how much of this is being done by Nitin Gadkari himself, how much is being dictated by the Prime Minister's office. Do people actually get to speak inside a cabinet meeting or is it one-way traffic? Why don't you try and answer some of these questions, Mr. Gadkari. Wait, before he talks, I'm sorry, I'm not interfering. But the person who talks the most in the cabinet meeting is Nitin Gadkari. <laughs> You know, I must also tell everyone sitting here that Piyush Goel accused us of giving him lesser time than the others because he came here and suddenly saw that there was a counter going on and said, Aapne mujhe kam time diya. That's not true. Everybody got the same amount of time, Piyush. Yes, Nitin. It is the one of the tragedy with our party and our government is image versus reality and down reality versus perception. We have a very strong discussion in the cabinet. Many times we oppose the views of even whatever the Prime Minister have and there is a democratic system and by the system we are taking the decisions. But the perception in the mind of the some of the people, those who are against our government, they want to create that there is no democratic system. The one man say another are only following the thing. This is not the fact. We have a qualitative discussion. Everyone is free. Sometimes Piyush, Piyush Goel criticize my policies. Sometimes I criticize Piyush Goel policies. And it is taking all the thing in a very healthy atmosphere. And we are all working for the interests of the country. We are transparent time bound, result oriented and first most important thing is that our cabinet that we are making the policies and taking the decision. Not taking decision is not the policy of our cabinet. So, Piyush, you said that the one who is the most talkative in cabinet uh, meetings is Nitinji. Who talks the least and who gets scolded the most? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about who talks the least but what Nitinji says is always a value add. I promise you the, its subject could be anything. It's a 360 degree vision that he brings to the cabinet. And uh, sometimes many of us are amazed that about his knowledge, even about innovation, about very oblique subjects which have nothing to do with what he's done in his life. But the person who gets scolded the most is obviously yours truly. And Nitin ji, take baat hai? Sabse zyada daat agar kisko padti hai? Aapko kyu daat padti hai? I'm not doing a good enough job. No, no, no. This is not a thing. The initiative taken by the power ministry, and I don't only, I'm not giving compliments to Piyush, but I am always talking that you make the performance of audit performance, audit for performances. And as far as the, his audit for his ministry, his achievements are also great. And he is doing and taking constantly decision. And it is a very complicated situation. Many of the important matters are subjudice. There are a lot of criticism from media. And taking the decision related to the coal, related to the power, there are a lot of projects which are in NPA now in power, they are facing the problem. In a situation, the way in which with the transparency, Piyush has taken the decision. It is remarkable, that is one of the reasons that now India is coal surplus. India is coal surplus. And the power point of the generation capacity is also increased. But we are discussing the issue many times and there may be difference of opinion, it, but there are honest difference of opinion. We are not biased about it. You know, one of the things that was said as a critique of the Modi government, uh, Nitinji, is that while there's a lot of actual development that's happened and actual work that's been, uh, you know, made to happen, a lot of it is also exaggerated. You'd remember the editorial that TN Nainan wrote very recently where he said that you keep saying that the number of roads being constructed under the UPA were two kilometers every day and you've taken it up to 16. Uh, he says that's not necessarily true, it was 11 kilometers earlier. You have been able to increase it. His point was why exaggerate your claims? If you've done good work, tell people actually what you've done as opposed to presenting a picture that's rosier than reality. Then first of all, at the last time when UPA was, road construction comes to 2 kilometers per day. It is the data available. And today it is 18 kilometers per day. 
and the data is open if you want to see it you can see it on the site that is the fact the second important thing is i am talking about the water ports in ganga also we have five multimodal hub then five roro services are there 20 floating jetties 20 cement concrete jetties so total water port will be coming to ganga is some 53 54 even we can increase more so by converting 111 rivers into water port our port strength will be more than 2000 so I give that example to the honorable editor of the uh, magazine. So it is very difficult to understand the importance of waterways and because India doesn't have any successful story about it. So that is one of the reasons, but sometimes it is difficult for us to uh, clear the things which are people never seen. Regarding waterways, it is a difficult thing for me that when I'm talking anything, it is very difficult for me to convince the people. But one thing as a journalist, I'm telling you, you write down my every declaration in your diary. The journalists, they, those who don't know me from last 30 years, I never give false promises. I never talk anything nonsense. If I want to do it, I say yes. If I want to don't do it, I publicly say I'm not going to do it. No. So my record is 100%. When I'm making announcement for 100%, you take it from me. And today register so, in your diary that it will be 125% performance, you will get it. So Piyush, can we extract a promise from all of you? Because I remember tracking Nitish Kumar before the Bihar polls. And one of his campaign points was that if I don't deliver electricity to every village by 2015, I won't ask for votes. Is Piyush Goel prepared to tell us here at the India Today Conclave that if your very tall promise of ensuring electricity to every Indian by 2019 is not fulfilled, Piyush Goel and the BJP will not ask people for their votes in 2019. Well, that's for you to keep uh, discussing about promises and this and that. We are only focused on performance. We'll go into 2019 with performance. In his department, in my department, in Nirmalaji's department, we'll go to the people with our track record. Everybody in this country will have 24 by 7 energy access in 2019, that's a commitment we are making to the people of India. Ms. Sita Raman, how far do you think you've been able to come in trying to ensure that there is actual ease of doing business? Because there are lots of young, budding entrepreneurs. How easy it is today, in comparison with two years ago, to actually start up and set up and stand up in India? I would believe it is far easier now. And you have a government which is hearing and listening to what is required to be done. We are also engaging with the states. Piyush referred during his presentation to cooperative federalism. We in our ministry are actually executing it through the states. States have been absolutely cooperative with us. I've not had the experience of even one state telling me, I'm sorry, these things cannot be done in my state because they realize that if only they do many of the things which are now collectively being engaged in, they stand to benefit. They stand to get better investments. And therefore, ease of doing business is something which is work which is getting done. 99 hurdles were removed, 340 more are being removed by the uh, end of this year. Otherwise, this government would not have had the courage to engage a completely independent, uh, that's for you, not for me, uh, a completely independent consultant be guided by the World Bank in terms of the parameters and then put the states to be ranked as to which state is better on ease of doing business. And that's going to happen this year too. So, yes, today's India is far better than any other time. The Sarsang Chalak of the RSS, Mohanji Bhagwat on the 3rd of March gave a speech in which he said we need to give training to our youngsters to chant Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Asuddin Ovesi asks the RSS, I am a patriot, I don't want to chant Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Why should Ovesi and others be forced to chant Bharat Mata Ki Jai if they don't want to? Does it make them anti-national? Does it make them a traitor? Last night I was watching a TV program. And all the political parties except OIC, they were objecting to his very statement, irrespective of the political ideology. And even the Congress uh, leaders also said, you can say Bharat Mata Ki Jai or Jai Hind or anything. 
the thing is not the question the words bharat mata ki jai the thing is what you want to express through your words your speeches your action that is the thing bharat mata ki jai everybody should uh, shout a slogan that is nothing wrong in that no there is absolutely Because, nothing wrong but what if somebody says i don't want to say bharat mata ki jai is he in the view of the rss a traitor of course he is an anti national if he says because the very thing when you say that you do not want to chant bharat mata ki jai you are not allowing others also to not chant bharat mata ki jai and vande matra and bharat mata ki jai are not the mantras or the uh, slogans coined by rss the moment you say let there be a debate on reservation let creamy layer be properly defined then your critics will say this is a nagpur upper caste brahmin dominated organization that has never been comfortable with the idea of reservation and therefore with modi as swayam sevak in power now wants to try and find a way of doing away with reservation the politicization of reservation is detrimental to the nation's interest it has been politicized number 2 the wishes of the constitution makers was that uh, the people who deserve the reservation benefit should get it in a stipulated time but unfortunately it has not reached them so that is why the creamy layer was not suggested by rss the social scientists the political pundits the people who have studied the issue they suggested the creamy layer the supreme court endorsed it of course then uh, what is wrong in uh, demanding that uh, there should be creamy layer applied it is in the interest of the people who are not uh, getting the benefit of the reservation within the same sections who have been deprived of the chances and opportunities do you believe it is correct to enforce one view of nationalism one view of patriotism on everyone why are students so unhappy there's so much outrage in campuses from the hyderabad university campus to jnu to fdii it almost seems as if there is a problem in dealing with dissent that is for the government rss doesn't uh, uh, take these things it is for the government to deal with it why the anti india feelings are being expressed on the campuses bharat virodhi anti india is anti national and if uh, a group of students whether they are students of that campus or they are outsiders if they are raising the slogans that india should be broken into pieces if they are raising slogans in favor of a criminal who attacked the temple of democracy and who has been hanged according to the law of the land if uh, slogans are raised in favor of in support eulogizing such people then what do we conclude can any nation in this uh, world we cannot tolerate this why do women have no place in the rss so why can there not be a day when instead of you or mon ji bhagwat a woman rises to be the head of the rss why do you have a separate category for them rashtriya swayam sevak sangh is having some physical activity also on the open ground so so because because we play kabaddi because we uh, we have many Uh, physical activities this society when it was when the rss started so we have not uh, suddenly overnight revolution cannot take place uh, like in the western countries here so that's why we have adopted that uh, the rss will be open to men only in the field activity men and women are not there together in the sangshaka all other activities of the rss are uh, women are there is there a possibility that the rss is view on homosexuality also could possibly change sir the sexual preferences are private and personal why rss should discuss that in public true but would there be opposition from the rss if section 377 what happens in the inside is, the room i don't know you don't think of homosexuality as a crime that needs to be penalized that's against indian tradition for example i don't think i don't think it it should be treated as a crime that should be punished as long as it doesn't affect the life of others why do we not see the rss distance itself more openly from these fringe elements who give the rss and hindutva a bad name we are not even embraced the question of distancing comes only if i have spoken on behalf of them 
the question of distancing comes before only if I have embraced them. When I have not done it, why should I say I repeatedly that I, I should distance? No. Have I supported that? Has the RSS issued any but statement? But you haven't condemned what they did either. We have condemned. We have condemned. We are on record that what has happened the vandalism in front of Patiala High Court cannot be condoned, cannot be acknowledged, cannot be supported. Break news coming in this afternoon. Bomb scare at the Indira Gandhi International Airport in Delhi. Threat to Air India, Nepal Airlines flight. All uh, on board two flights have been detained. Let's check. Speak. So this time it's going to be me who's going to be talking to it's you. It's going to be me who's going to tell you what's new from the world of technology. We have news, we have reviews and we have Sahil doing the Redmi Note 3 review. And...